everyone, this is Kelly Mara here. Today we are going to be discussing some changes to Yandere Chan's backstory, well, my version of Yandere Chan at least, and other suggestions you guys left for me on my revamping Ayano Aishi video. I know I previously said that I was going to read out these suggestions in my Redesigning Senpai video, but there were so many amazing suggestions and so much to talk about. And I don't want that video to be too long, nor do I want to spend too much time on that video just talking about unrelated things. Additionally, there are also some serious issues that you guys brought up with my rewrite of Yandere Chan that I felt justified making a separate video on it. And this is also the first and most important thing I would like to make right. Now, you guys know that I'm a nursing student and a huge advocate for mental health, in part because of my profession and the other part because I genuinely am passionate about it. And one of my biggest pet peeves is when mental illnesses are misrepresented in media and misinformation is spread. I made a video specifically about depression and using online platforms as a coping mechanism that was loosely connected to the Hopeless Peaches drama if you guys want to check that out, especially if you're struggling with suicidal thoughts and are currently using social media as your coping method. However, this recent rewrite utilizing a mental illness as a core aspect for a protagonist of such a brutal, morally reprehensible story is doing the exact opposite of my intentions. Putting someone suffering from severe psychosis as the face of a murder game isn't the way to go and I realize that and I also realize how it, it can lead to serious stigma against psychosis. Although I, as a health professional, understand that acts of brutality brought on by psychosis are extremely severe and rare cases that can involve many social, environmental, and genetic factors, the average viewer, especially my younger audience, might not. Because of this, they might develop the perception that this is just how psychosis is and use that to generalize real people suffering from psychosis. So before that misinformation spreads, I want to stop it right here. I've decided to rewrite that part of my rewrite and change it to something that is less tangible, shall we say, and lean into the more fantasy slash fiction aspect of anime. Plus, I realized that in my attempt to make the protagonist more compelling on her own and adding lore that was actually relevant to her, I made her story way edgier than it originally was, so let's quickly fix that, shall we? From now on, I want to be explicitly clear that the condition Yandere Chan has is not psychosis. It is simply the Yandere condition, or shall I pronounce it correctly, Yandere condition that is an extremely rare medically unrecognized condition that specifically afflicts young girls in this universe. What this condition entails is a tendency to violence, manipulation, lack of empathy, and difficulty forming emotional attachments. However, once an attachment is formed, it quickly becomes toxic. The girls will become extremely obsessed and fixated on the object of their attachment to the point that they will cause harm to themselves or others, be it purposefully or accidentally. Now, that isn't to say that she doesn't have emotions, of course. In that regard, she's just like everyone else. She still feels scared, confused, angry, and happy. However, what made it difficult for her was knowing that she was different. Her lack of empathy is a major disadvantage because it meant she could never understand how others are feeling, what they're thinking, and because of that, she always felt alone and isolated. She can't relate to others, she's stuck in her own head, unable to understand why others laugh and cry at experiences that wasn't theirs. She knew she was missing that part that everyone else seemed to have and it frustrated her. It made her angry at how unfair that was. She also doesn't murder her parents. Instead, she has always had a troubled childhood. She couldn't make any friends, and she has always been fascinated by gore and violence in movies. She enjoys killing small animals and getting into fights at school, and as a result, she would get sent home quite a lot. Her grades suffered, which worried her parents even more. Additionally, she also started turning them against each other whenever they try to discuss this with her to try and avoid it. And she does this either by outright lying or making up stories about the other. When her parents figured out that everything she had told them had been a lie, they try to confront her together. But when they do, she loses her temper and threatens them both with a knife. A fight broke out and she stabs her father in the leg and cuts her mother in the face in the process, but the injuries are superficial. 
And that night, while her parents were brought to the emergency room, she was brought to a psychiatric ward to be examined, where she ended up being admitted for an overnight stay. They found she was unstable, but her diagnosis was inconclusive. They tried treating her as best as they could using their knowledge of existing mental illnesses, but nothing seemed to work. The overnight stay grew into two nights, then three. It kept getting longer and longer, and Yandere-chan grew more and more restless. At this point, it was more than just the Yandere condition she was suffering from. There was also shock, trauma, guilt for her actions, and fear. Fear that she had torn her own family apart and was losing her parents. She was fully aware of what she had been doing, of course, but this was also the first time that she had really ever attacked someone and the first time she had ever really had to face the consequences. This conflict in herself made her act out on many different occasions, causing several code blacks and injuring hospital staff to the point that she had to be restrained and sedated. Of course, this gave her a pretty bad reputation among the hospital staff because she would then proceed to try and pull manipulation tactics on them to get them to turn on each other just out of spite. She would have been put on pretty much every psychiatric medication class out there from antipsychotics to mood stabilizers, and although it didn't quite resolve her underlying urges, it dulled her senses enough to calm her down. However, this then results in negative symptoms. In mental health, we have the term negative and positive symptoms. Positive symptoms are usually behaviors or experiences that add to the normal experience. Things like hallucinations, delusions, or excessive movements or restlessness. Negative symptoms take away from the normal experience, such as inability to show emotions, apathy, difficulty speaking, and withdrawing from social situations and relationships. These positive and negative symptoms often occur in those with schizophrenia but can also be a side effect of certain psychiatric medications. Because of this, the doctor suggested electroconvulsive therapy, to which her parents consented. Now, what is ECT, you might ask? Although the description might sound a bit terrifying, it's actually a really safe and effective treatment. Usually as a last resort for people with mental disorders that has not responded to any other treatments. ECT involves a brief electrical stimulation of the brain while the patient is under anesthesia. Basically, what happens is, an ECT machine passes a carefully controlled electric current through the brain, which affects the brain's activity and induces a minor seizure to reset the brain. There is a whole team of doctors, anesthetists, and nurses overseeing the procedure, so it's completely safe. Of course, for a young girl, it's quite a confronting experience, especially when you're going through it by yourself. Luckily, the procedure works. Her condition starts to be controlled and she starts making progress using other coping mechanisms to curb her urges, that is, until Taro gets admitted. Because then, her condition re-emerges with a fury. For the first time, she forms an emotional attachment and with it, she experiences empathy, a feeling of belonging and relief from her isolation. He became the most important person to her, the center of her world, and she was not to be without him ever again. And this is where the first suggestion I really like comes in. Porcelain Pig says, I think with a combo of meds and acting, which can help with cover-ups later on, Yan Chan should have been able to pretend to be normal. For example, she could have copied the progress of someone in the psych ward that was able to leave. She could have faked a breakthrough and recovery with the doctor and gotten out. Because honestly, if she is a wanted criminal who just escaped, she's not gonna be able to enroll in school without someone noticing. And that is a very good point. If we were using my previous backstory concept, this wouldn't have been a viable option simply because it's really hard to fake recovery. As stated in this comment by Yeeted Cat Beans, psych ward staff are highly trained to spot the holes in people's backstories or behaviors. Thus, faking it would be much more difficult than physically escaping the facility because that skill is how we identify people's conditions on a case-by-case -case basis. However, depending on why you're there and what sort of order you have for your stay, some patients are actually allowed to leave the ward once or twice a day. At the same time, psych wards are also not prisons. They don't have guards in front of 
all the doors at all times. Although the doors only do open with a key card that the nurses and doctors have, you'd actually be surprised how common it is for people to abscond, especially if they've never been there before. Typically, unless we believe you're at serious risk of harming yourself or others, or if you don't have the capacity to make your own decisions, you won't be held there against your will. You are allowed to refuse treatment and leave. We only really have security personnel in acute areas where the patients are volatile or when we have a code black. Of course, take that with a grain of salt because that was my personal experience with psych wards in Australia where consent and autonomy is a big thing. And I'm not sure how it is in Japan. So if you're familiar with the system there, let me know down below. But essentially, that was my reasoning for Yanchan escaping and then using a fake identity to enroll in school. However, I felt that this suggestion is a much better homage to the manipulation tactic she will proceed to use in school where people will be much easier to manipulate. Because of that suggestion, I also incorporated more of Yanchan's scummy, manipulative behavior in addition to just the violence in her backstory. And in this setting, because her condition is a fictional yandere condition that not even the nurses or doctors know anything about, it would be easier for her to deceive them. Especially because for the first time, she genuinely felt happy, despite the darker undertones that were hiding beneath it. After years and years of basically living in the psych ward, she finally gets discharged. Except, we soon learn that after hearing the news that their daughter was being discharged, her parents had left town, abandoning her. And this hurt her more than anything she had ever experienced before. This emotional pain she felt was overwhelming and seemingly inescapable. And for the first time in her life, she cried real tears of sorrow. And maybe in a way, she doesn't really realize what she's doing is all that bad because that's just how things are to her. So the abandonment really stung. She never expected her parents to leave her for it. And this results in her fear of abandonment and why she becomes so desperate to never lose Taro. She just doesn't want to feel that pain again. She was left to the custody of the government and this is where things get tricky. At 16, Yanchan is still considered a minor so she can't live independently and requires a legal guardian. However, I did some research and apparently orphanages in Japan only take in kids up to the age of 3 years old and they're made to leave as young as the age of 15. There's also a pretty big stigma against orphan children as they're perceived as thrown away kids and there's just not much information in general about them. As a result, they're at greater risk of homelessness and have less access to work or even study opportunities. I investigated some more and found other articles saying that orphan kids are more commonly placed with relatives than foster families, which only happens for 12% of orphans. Of course, if the information I got is incorrect or if you are someone from or living in Japan, please let me know what the custody system is like for minors there. But anyway, Let's just say she ends up staying with an uncle, maybe the brother of her mother who isn't much of a parental figure and mostly leaves her alone because he's busy working all the time, leaving really early and coming home really late. This does change things slightly, for example, the availability of medications because now Yan Chan can just refill her prescriptions at any time. I guess the barrier here would just be that the more murders she commits, regardless of if she gets caught or not, the more stress it puts on her and the less effective these medications and coping mechanisms become. It also sort of discourages people from just killing and encourages them to try the other tactics too. However, I think for her own protection and for the protection of people around her because of the whole violent tendencies thing, she wouldn't be allowed to attend school in person, at least until she has adapted to living outside of the hospital. I imagine she does most of her schoolwork at home and watches online lectures and maybe has separate exam times from everybody else. Which means she has plenty of leeway to sneak off and secretly attend academy while her uncle is at work. Yes, that does mean she has twice as much schoolwork and homework to do, but there's no rest for the wicked. And that's when she runs into our rich girl, which also brings us to the next suggestion. 
I really like this comment by Kmart saying that perhaps the rich girl is new to the area. If her family runs a large business, perhaps with a chain around the country, her family would move a fair amount depending on where the head of the company needs to be, whichever of her guardians. This means not many people at the school actually know her or her face and thus other students in the school wouldn't be as sus to why the rich girl looked different. Perhaps she was talking to a few new people she met at a fancy shop when Yandere-chan meets her. When Yandere-chan enrolls, it does have to be in the rich girl's name as that's the name on the report card that would go back to the parent. She doesn't need to pull a full disguise on, but rather have a wealthy appearance as to not tarnish the rich girl's family name. And this was exactly what I had in mind as well, and so yeah, I consider this canon. And now, let's talk about your suggestions for the identity of Yandere-chan and the rich girl. A lot of you seem to agree that Yan-chan's true identity should be unknown and that the rich girl is Ayano Aishi, which is the name that we use throughout the game as our fake identity. My favorite suggestion, however, comes from Ali Folkerth, who said, Have it be a complete mystery throughout the game. Have it be a conflict as through her delusions she loses a sense of herself. Am I Ayano and if I'm not, who could I possibly be? Do I want to be Ayano? Are these friends I may or may not have made my friends or Ayano's friends? Does Senpai love me or Ayano? Is there a difference anymore? Only for it to be answered in the good ending after you seduce Senpai. After a good day at school, you meet by the cherry blossom tree, he holds your hand and he acknowledges you. Maybe it's a nickname he gave you at the ward and maybe it's a look but you both realize that he knows it's you and loves you anyway. And you realize as well that it doesn't matter. He loves you and that's enough. Then you go back to the ward with the knowledge that you are loved and appreciated with your friends and senpai in mind, you walk up to the front desk or you're led inside your room and the last line of the game is, I'm first name, last name, and I'm here for my mental evaluation. This was so good, it literally gave me shivers. I imagine this would definitely be the best ending for the hypothetical remake where Senpai actually convinces her to get better and take control of her condition. So she willingly comes back to the ward and if she did some murders, maybe she'd confess to them and he visits her every day. It also takes us neatly into the third and final topic I wanted to discuss today. What is Yanchan's interaction with Senpai like in this version, with him meeting her in a psych ward? Does he not recognize her? Does she have to pretend not to know him? Well, my idea is that he actually recognizes her right away. I think it adds a layer of connection and solidarity between them for having that tough experience together. And you also have that rapport established right away, which you now have the option of exploring further. Now, I know what you're thinking. What about her name? Well, she wouldn't have wanted to share her name with him at first, both out of her own shame and mistrust, and I love Ali's idea of Senpai giving her a nickname because that would be an incredibly cute touch. So when they meet again in school, it wouldn't be strange for him to learn that her name is Aishi Ayano because he always addressed her with his nickname anyway and she never would have told him her name. As for the fact they met in a psych ward, well, why would he go around telling people that she was a psych patient when he was one too? Although I do think there could also be a make or break point in the game where Senpai discovers that you're not the real Ayano and depending how well you've built your relationship with him, he will still care for you anyway and maybe even help you conceal your identity when people start questioning it because in my hypothetical, Senpai is a ride or die kind of guy to so the people he really cares about and is possibly just as fucked up as you are, if you're convincing enough, he will actually help you get away with murder. Maybe that could be an ending of its own where you corrupt Senpai and become a murderous couple. And when you finally confess to him and admit to him that you're not who he thinks you are, he tells you that he knows. He's known for a while now and reassures you that he loves you, not the person you're pretending to be. 
I also like this suggestion from Yanni Bear saying that Yan Chan should have a more girly, innocent, and cute vibe, and I think that's definitely a persona she puts up when she manipulates people to throw them off her trail. She would literally crush everyone in Among Us, let me tell you that. And as Ali says, you finally learn her real name. There weren't as many name suggestions, and the few I had, I didn't really resonate with. So, I looked around for names myself, and I decided that her name would be... Himari. Sato Himari. And that is the end of the video. Thank you so much if you made it all the way to the end. I really didn't expect the video to get as long as it did, but here we are. Also, I want to thank you guys so much for 8k. I'm almost at 9k now, which is absolutely insane that I'm so close to 10k subscribers. I, <laughs> I feel like I haven't done much at all, but it's just... Thank you so much. There's currently a lot going on in the commentary community right now with uh, Peaches and Prison Mate Luke and now Creepshow Art as well. And I really want to address that sometime soon. However, I do have a commitment to you guys to put out that Senpai redesign, which I'm just going to quickly do first. And then afterwards, I'll start covering some of the drama that has unfolded, essentially. But anyway, thank you so much for all the amazing fan art. And if you guys want your art to be featured in my videos as well, please send it to this email right here. If you guys enjoyed this video, please leave a like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Please check out my comic, that would make me very happy. Follow me on all my social media, and I will see you guys in the next video. Goodbye!